Good afternoon. I know sometimes we don't expect responses in church unless they're the ones in the prayer book. So, my name is Matthew Payne. I'm the lay canon for administration for the Diocese of Fond du Lac, and I am so pleased and thrilled that you are with us today. Uh, we began regularly uh, celebrating the commemoration of Charles Chapman Grafton about 2002, 2003, with uh, being intentional about celebrating his day. Uh, as you know, it has been added to the calendar and holy men and holy women of the Episcopal Church, uh, along with uh, some of those of who were his friends and his mentors and had influence on the Episcopal <laughs> Church to this day. We also hope to continue in the future to continue to host these and to have them grow each year. Uh, and I'm one of the people, along with folks from the cathedral and, and the bishop, uh, looking to have this become a little bit more broader as time goes on. Uh, it's my hope and my dream, and I'm sharing it now because some of you in the audience might want to participate in this, and that is that maybe in five, six, seven, ten years, uh, it might even expand to be maybe a Friday to Saturday thing with student papers and uh, papers from folks who are interested, that sort of thing, as, as time goes on. Because uh, I think Bishop Grafton would have really liked that. He really liked having people share what they thought, even though he wouldn't necessarily agree with it all. He liked it when people shared it. Um, and part of uh, the idea of being Catholic is being open to the universality of, of God working in the world, and that can be reflected in so many ways. Many of you know Richard Mamana, whether you know him by name or not, because if you have an interest in Anglo-Catholic history or Anglo-Catholicism, chances are if you have been on the internet, you have seen the result of his leadership and his work. And that is, of course, Project Canterbury or AnglicanHistory.org, where Richard has taken the lead and has folks helping him to not only take uh, documents and papers and writings of those luminaries in the Anglo-Catholic Church, but take them and actually transcribe them so folks like us who still need to change our glasses to read it can read it rather than trying to read the script that is up there. And it's a wonderful blessing to the church. Of course, Richard is, is broader than that. He is married and has a new child, um, which talking to him a little bit has changed his life a little bit. Um, he has finished his course studies for a master's degree from Yale, uh, but is working on getting ready to defend his thesis in October, I believe. He is also on the board of the Living Church, as well as many other things that he does. Um, one of the things that I am just thrilled about is that uh, talking with him about today, and, and by the way, we met via the internet, but it wasn't a dating site, I just want to make that clear. <laughs> um, but it's interesting, because I realized that Richard and I have actually not talked voice to voice until today, but yet we have probably shared thousands and thousands of words, as well as some documents. And, and that reflects kind of the fact that there's so much in the world that we can share. Sometimes it takes voices, sometimes it doesn't, but it's still valuable information that can be used for the glory of God. So I would like you to welcome our guest speaker, Richard Maman. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I, I'm concerned to make sure that everyone can hear me, and I wonder if it's possible possible to do that. You're good with without this. We, we have pe we have people who need that to hear. Okay. Okay. Um, I did I did just read this paper to Bishop Grafton um, this afternoon, and uh, I won't claim that I have his imprimatur for what I'm about to say. <laughs> he did not complain. <laughs> I'll start right in. Um, last Easter morning, uh, my godfather and closest friend died in New York City after a three-year battle with cancer. Uh, he was 81 years old, and I had had dinner or lunch with him um, at least once a week for about the last 15 years of his life. Uh, just hours before he died, he had received Holy Communion from his parish priest from the reserved sacrament and it was brought to him from an altar where he had been an almost daily communicant for the last two decades. 
Thomas Newton Ray was his name, and he was, like I am, a member of the Confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament and a confirmed admirer of Bishop Grafton. The death of his saints is precious in the sight of God, and Tom's death was perhaps unusually, perfectly, and astonishingly Eucharistic. I think in its own way it was a kind of fruit of the widespread Anglo-Catholic rank and file devotion to the Blessed Sacrament fostered by Bishop Grafton through the confraternity. But it's actually not about his life or personal devotion that I would like to speak to you just now. Over the course of the last dozen years, I have visited Wisconsin almost annually. I've missed a few meetings in connection with the work of the Living Church Foundation and to visit my friends, Father Charles and Dr. Jennifer Henry, um, formerly of Michaud House. And without fail, every time I told Tom that I wouldn't be able to have dinner with him next week because I would be in Milwaukee, he said, oh, you're going away to the Holy Land again. <laughs> well, send me a postcard. Tom was on to something. Anglo-Catholic Episcopalians on the Eastern Seaboard of certain generation still actually do speak with some seriousness about the Upper Midwest, the old Beretta Belt, and especially places like Fond du Lac, Delafield, Racine, Kenosha, Neshota, Milwaukee, Sheboygan, Eau Claire, in hushed voices as the Holy Land. Having had the chance to enjoy the Dean and Mrs. Benno's hospitality last night and this morning to pray at Bishop Grafton's tomb today and to visit Wisconsin regularly as long as I have, I think I can say with some certainty that this is more than just a figure of speech. I'm conscious today of being in a holy place and speaking on holy subjects. And I'm among you as a pilgrim, uh, a grateful admirer of your diocese, your bishop, your canon archivist, and nearly that dean of your cathedral. I'm truly honored and humbled to be with you today in this holy land. I'm grateful for the patient correspondence of Canon Matthew Payne over an entire year. Um, and I also find myself in the extraordinary debt of Bishop Jacobus, Bishop Salmon, and the Living Church Foundation, as well as two anonymous donors who have done so much to make this possible. Both long-term members of this cathedral church and first-time visitors will notice two striking elements, if we're paying attention, of Bishop Grafton's remarkable sarcophagus. On one end, near the bishop's feet, is a brass seal showing a fish, the waves of a lake, the sword of the spirit, echoing Ephesians chapter 6, and the keys of the kingdom of heaven. This is, of course, the seal of the Diocese of Fond du Lac, a community Bishop Grafton served in sickness and in health for 24 years, from 1888 to 1912. At the other end, again in brass, and close to the bishop's mitre, is another seal showing a chalice and pattern. The image is a familiar symbol of the Holy Eucharist, evoking through the vessels used in the celebration of the Mass, the sacramental gifts of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the seal of the Confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament, a devotional society founded in England in 1862. Grafton was the first American member of this organization, and he introduced it to the United States just five years after its foundation. This afternoon, I propose a handful of investigations moving in their way between these two ends of Bishop Grafton's tomb. On the one hand, his local American personal and Midwestern context, and on the other hand, his supranational, international, mystical and devotional life. First, I will offer some historical context and an evaluation of the neglected place of devotional societies in the wider history of Anglicanism and the Episcopal Church. I will sketch a brief history of the confraternity, then a discussion of the role of Father Grafton, then Bishop Grafton, in serving himself as a kind of transatlantic bridge for the introduction and promotion of English ritualism and Anglo-Catholicism in the Episcopal Church. I will review his work and writings connected with confraternity and close with a reflection on what it might all mean and where it has brought or led us. Wherever possible, I will try to use Bishop Grafton's own words. By friends and people who've known me for a long time, I've been accused of having been born in the 30s. 
by, by which I mean the 1830s, not the 1930s. <laughs> I unfortunately do not have the benefit of that gift of either longevity. So in order to think and talk about Bishop Grafton and the confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament, we need to go in our minds to 1867, a time none of us here today actually remember. In 1867, the American economy was in shambles. The plantation and cotton-based economies of the American South had not yet begun to recover in any measurable way from the Civil War. Anglo-Americans and the German-Americans who were my father's fathers in Pennsylvania were anxious to the point of distraction about a tide of Irish immigration threatening to change the religious, ethnic, and political makeup of the nation. The war had touched every family and community with the death of relatives, with extreme inflation, or with some other tangible form of pain, painful sacrifice and privation. National confidence in government was at a low as Reconstruction began to establish, to overturn established, but for some very comfortable inequalities in the South. A congressional commission at loggerheads with the executive branch was contemplating the impeachment of President Andrew Johnson. The United States had just purchased Alaska in what appeared to nearly everyone to be an unjustifiable and extremely expensive participation by our country in the affairs of a very remote place. Alfred Nobel invented dynamite in 1867, putting the cutting edge of technology in the deadly service of warfare around the world. New Orleans saw record heat waves and an outbreak of yellow fever with more than 3,000 fatalities. If these similarities between 1867 and 2012 are not enough to establish how little times have changed, there was even a presidential election moving on the horizon. <laughs> the church's response to the changes and chances of the late 1860s was a familiar mixture of effective action, false starts, and lasting legitimate developments. Charles Chapman Grafton, whose life, writings, good works, faith, and we trust ongoing intercession for us on high are the reason we have gathered to give thanks today, was one of a group of clergy who responded to these peculiar challenges of the time in which they lived with what I will choose to call an attitude of sacramental intensification. Faced with a national life whose difficulties can't be understated, and a church in which threats of schism and chaos were very real, he pointed his friends and his flock in one direction throughout his entire ministry, to the reenactment of the Last Supper, to, participates, to participation in the ordinance of Holy Communion in the reverent celebration of the Mass. Bishop Grafton offered the Holy Eucharist as a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, which for him meant something revolutionary. This is not to say that he diverted attention from the real problems of the wide world or the church on earth into a focus on liturgy. Very far from it, actually. Liturgy and ecclesiastical matters were not an escape for Grafton from reality. But I do mean to say that for Grafton, the Blessed Sacrament was in a real sense the answer to all of the woes of both the church and the world. The Mass changed the world and was an answer to the world's problems precisely because the mass in Grafton's understanding changes us. This approach of intensified sacramentalism was in large part the fruit of the proliferation of devotional guilds and societies in the life of the 19th century Church of England and the Episcopal Church. Devotional societies are not a phenomenon specific to Anglicanism, but I think it's fair to say that they have flourished most especially and lastingly in the fertile soil of our part of Christianity. From the earliest days of the church's history, men and women have formed small groups within the church um, to effect some kind of major change. We can look at the earliest monastic movements, for example, as attempts to deepen Christian practice through rigorous prayer, fasting, and asceticism. And they did this mainly within the existing structures of the church, but also as a way of becoming a kind of leaven in the loaf to improve and challenge the spiritual life of other Christians. At other times in Christian history, different movements have coalesced around specific practices and doctrines, calling the wider church around them to a deeper and more serious understanding of the faith once delivered to the saints. In the main streams of Western Catholic Christianity, we can point to groups like the Cistercians of the 11th and 12th centuries, 
the large numbers of parish-based devotional guilds and societies of the late Middle Ages, the work of John and Charles Wesley within the Church of England. In each instance, there is an effort to gather interested individuals into small groups. Evangelicals might actually comfortably understand them as small groups. Um, for a renewed focus on some neglected aspect of Christian life. Sociologists of religion look at devotional societies and religious orders as manifestations of a kind of human behavior practiced by the religious virtuoso, a term that comes from Max Weber's seminal work, Economy and Society. This kind of individual, at least in the understanding of figures like Weber, Michael Hill, and Patricia Whitberg, is someone who strives for perfection within an existing religious tradition. This sort of person does not strike out alone to claim charismatic religious authority, and does not claim his or own direct access to divine inspiration. Rather, the religious virtuoso, and I realize that this term is lacking on the surface, pushes the requirements of the tradition to their furthest possible limit. I would make the claim that this is precisely the work of Bishop Grafton and his fellow members of the Confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament. Sacramental intensification, which in, within the established canonical, liturgical, legal, and practical guidelines of 19th century Anglicanism. In this, they were in very good company. In part because of the established nature of the Church of England, the 19th and even the 18th centuries, although that is a conversation for another day, fostered a situation in which individuals with spiritual commitments often associated formally with each other. A major impetus for these kinds of associations came in the very, very wide wake of the Oxford Movement, inspired by the academic discourses and homiletical work of writers like John Keeble, John Henry Newman, Edward Booth Pusey, and their associates. Their tracts for the times established a detailed platform for the recovery and nourishment of Catholic doctrine, sensibility, and practice in the contemporary Church of England, and the actual implementation of these deals, uh, ideals often took place in the context of a devotional society. The earliest among such groups no longer exist. For example, the Association for the Promotion of the Unity of Christendom, established in 1857 to further ecumenical aims with which almost all Christians would assent today, collapsed because the formal censure of Roman Catholic members uh, who, be because of the formal censure of Roman Catholic members who were at that time consorting with Christians of other communions. Very specific organizations have also folded, like St. Martin's League for Postmen, founded, <laughs> it was actually very influential, founded in 1877 to assist postal workers to, quote, lead good lives, to have at heart the common brotherhood of humanity and to office, offer houses of rest where they could pray, sleep, eat, or read in quiet. Still, there are a large number of survivals that will be familiar to many of us today. The Guild of All Souls was founded in 1873 in England and in 1889 in the United States to encourage requiem masses, prayers for the dead, the use of holy unction in the anointing of Christians close to death, and it publishes its own list of members and posthumous members on whose behalf prayers have been requested. Likewise, the Society of King Charles the Martyr, founded in 1894 in England, and active almost immediately in the United States, especially in Boston, encourages the observance of January 30th as a religious occasion on which the death of King Charles I is kept liturgically. Today's Anglican Society of Mary actually traces its roots to a much more recent uh, 1931 amalgamation organization called the Confraternity of Our Lady and the League of Our Lady, established in 1902. And lastly, the Order of St. Vincent, which dates to at least 1877 at St. Clement's Church in Philadelphia, and which claims its formal current organization at the Church of the Advent in Boston in 1915, is a group of acolytes who join together intentionally in prayer, study, service, and rules of life suited to their regular assistance in divine worship. I could multiply examples, but I won't. It suffices to say that, as should be the case at a family meal or a public library, there really is something for everybody in the world of Anglican devotional societies. The Confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament, near Grafton's Mitre, began in 1862 through the organizational efforts of Canon T.T. Carter. He's 
known familiarly to students of Anglo-Catholicism as Carter of Clure, based on the parish where he worked. Canon Carter was a kind of prototypical Tractarian and early ritualist priest. He published widely with a very, very large bibliography of his sermons and pamphlets focusing on church controversies. He compiled a devotional manual called The Treasure of Devotion, which had an influence in England much like our own well-known book, The Practice of Religion. He founded a sisterhood in 1852, the Sisters of St. John the Baptist. Sometimes it actually seems like every major Anglo-Catholic priest of the Church of England founded a sisterhood. <laughs> and their lives continue both in England and in the United States, uh, in New Jersey. Canon Carter's concern to establish an organization that would assert a traditional Catholic, Anglican, and sacramental doctrine of the Holy Communion began in the 1850s in connection with, an internal, with internal political decisions of the Church of England's juridical bodies that seemed to pull out the roots of the full teaching of the Church about the Holy Eucharist. By 1862, there was a critical mass of interest to create a formal structure for the promotion of a stronger Eucharistic discipline in a group setting. And in 1867, this group welcomed the incorporation of a similar group called the Society of the Blessed Sacrament, which had been founded as a parochial organization in London. The objects, rules, and recommendations of the confraternity are the same today as they were at the organizations founded in 1862. I will quote them verbatim and in their entirety to give a sense of the total doctrinal, devotional, ceremonial, liturgical, and ecclesiastical program envisioned by Canon Carter and planted in the United States by Bishop Grafton. Objects, bold. Number one, the honor due to the person of our Lord Jesus Christ and the blessed sacrament of his body and blood. Two, mutual and special intercession at the time of and in union with the Eucharistic sacrifice. Three, to promote the observance of the Catholic and primitive practice of receiving Holy Communion fasting. Rules, to communicate, or at least to be present, on Sundays and the greater festivals and other holy days when the Holy Eucharist is celebrated, unless prevented by sickness or other urgent cause. To promote by all legitimate means, I don't know what the legitimate means would be, frequent and reverent celebrations of the Holy Eucharist as the chief act of divine service. Three, to make such special intercessions as shall be from time to time directed. Recommendations, to give careful attention to preparation before and thanksgiving after every communion. Two, to communicate at an early celebration. Three, to make at every celebration one or more of the following acts of faith, of adoration, of spiritual communion, of thanksgiving, of reparation, of intercession, of prayer for the visible unity of Christendom. Four, to make acts of spiritual communion when deprived of the opportunity of receiving the Holy Eucharist. Five, and last, to make offerings for the due and reverent celebration of the Holy Eucharist. In order to carry out these objects, rules, and recommendations, the confraternity had a detailed constitution and laws. It was to be governed by a superior general and a council. Membership was open to any bishop, priest, deacon, brother, or sister of a religious community, or communicant of the English church who concurred with the objects, rules, recommendations, and laws. A monthly intercession paper provided guidance for the shared prayers of the confraternity's medals. A medal, also sometimes called a badge, uh, showing, I should note, the very same chalice and pattern on Bishop Grafton's tomb and on the, the door of the tabernacle at the altar near his sarcophagus was given to each member of the CBS. I'm going to start saying CBS instead of confraternity, the blessed sacrament, <laughs> if that's OK from time to time, as a token of membership to be worn or kept as long as one was a member of its standing. The confraternity also published an official manual at regular intervals, offering forms of prayer for preparation before and after receiving communion, a form of spiritual communion when members were unable to be present at church on Sundays or, ho or holy days, forms for the admissions of, of members and the blessing of their medals and devotional litanies. Although I have spoken in the past tense in the last paragraph about the foundation of the confraternity, I hasten to add that I could have also spoken in the present tense. The confraternity still exists. I have been a life member since 1997. I 
think I was the last person who got in the, the life membership at the low, low bargain price of $25. I think it's, <laughs> it's considerably higher now. Um, it still publishes its manual and a regular intercession paper. It still produces medals. Mine could use a polishing. It still has a superior general and a council. And its ongoing life in England, Scotland, Wales, Canada, Australia, the United States, and even oddly in Sweden is the evidence on which it grants its claim to be the oldest existing devotional society in the Anglican Communion. It's difficult for us to understand today precisely why the creation of the CDS invited so much criticism, provoked so much anger, and caused so many problems for its early members. After all, they wished to deepen their Christian devotion, and they looked to a community of like-minded people to do so. But this was deeply threatening to prevailing Anglican attitudes at the time. The New York Times followed with great interest reports of the numbers of English priests who were known to be members of the confraternity. A favorite tactic of anti-ritualist groups and agitators was to procure copies of the membership lists of the confraternity and its statistics, which were then published publicly for the shock and disgust of Protestant England. <laughs> Our friend Father Grafton fell in very happily and quickly with his group of sacramental misfits during his momentous journey to England in 1865. He was admitted as an associate of the CBS in July of that year by Kenton Carter, the founder himself, and he would write 30 years later of the importance of that day in his Christian walk. Two years later, on September 11th, the date and place are extraordinarily interesting to me. On September 11th, 1867, near what is now Crack Zero at Lower Manhattan, 37-year-old Bishop Grafton, Father Grafton, then a mission priest of the Cowley Fathers, gathered a group of three people at St. Paul's Chapel and admitted them as the first American members of the confraternity. One of them was the Reverend Thomas McKee Brown, the founding rector of the Church of St. Mary the Virgin Time, Times Square, which is known to friends and enemies as Smoky Marys. And not long after, he admitted all seven members of the fledgling community of St. Mary, founded by Mother Harriet Starr Cannon as members. By the next year, 1868, there was a war of the confraternity of the Church of the Advent in Boston. Early leadership of the confraternity in the United States shows evidence of what would come to be a strange and lasting pattern in American Anglo-Catholic life, namely a slippery but discernible cultural division between the upper Midwest and the Northeastern seaboard. From Chicago in the names of treasurers and superiors general in this very early period show names from Chicago and Milwaukee in, su in succession to names of priests and even from Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. But the annual conference and mass of the confraternity were almost always based on the East Coast, away from what I would contend were the real concentrated bases of its active diocesan membership and influence in places like Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Nebraska. As a side note, I think if I had some time and a daughter who is not teething. Uh, <laughs> a, a careful geographic and statistical analysis of data about where American Anglo Catholics were doing what and when uh, would, I think, be a worthwhile and very illuminating undertaking. Uh, probably also a chance to look at the notably diverging afterlives and current lives of institutions, as such as, for example, Neshota House or St. Mary the Virgin Times Square, which had very common origins and have diverged very significantly today. Nevertheless, the first two decades were a period of growth and increasing notoriety for the confraternity in the United States under the leadership of Father Grafton. Students of Bishop Grafton's life will remember that one of his major trials and disappointments was a disintegration of his relationship with the Society of St. John the Evangelist, the Cowley Fathers, whom he had joined as a monk mission priest in 1866, and with whom he was connected until 1883. The fundamental difficulty for Grafton was his sense of a conflicting loyalty uh, for English and American members of this brotherhood. The society refused to create an autonomous American province to accommodate these concerns, and the three American members of the society accordingly withdrew. Anglican monastic life in the United States suffered a setback from which it did not quickly recover. 
but I think it's noteworthy how different Grafton's relationships were with the authorities of the English branch of the CBS. Frequent and friendly correspondence between Grafton and Dor between Grafton and the leaders of the English confraternity uh, continue through and after his break with the SSJE. And I like to think that this has something to do with the fact that the CBS was founded on notions of spiritual communion. The deep communion shared by members of the confraternity on both sides of the Atlantic was strong enough to hold them together in fraternal devotion, even when jurisdictional issues were strong enough to split the Cali Fathers apart. I believe there may be a lesson here for modern, modern Anglicans in North America in this episode and the very different outcomes we can observe in Grafton's life. There was, however, trouble on the horizon for the organization brought to the United States by Father Grafton and fostered largely in its early years under his aegis. Critics alleged with fairly consistent seriousness that it was a secret society, pointing to the legitimate recommendation that members should, quote, maintain a proper secrecy and residence with respect to all common fraternity matters when in the presence of persons not associates. There were unfounded accusations in 1873 of interference in an Episcopal election in Massachusetts, during which our friend James DeCoven lost to Benjamin Henry Paddock on the grounds of his supposed association with the confraternity. But there's actually no evidence that James DeCoven was actually associated with the confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament. Grafton was singled out himself as by the chief representative of the old pre-ritualist high church school as, quote, an active agent of the confraternity when he visited the private rooms of students at DTS in New York. His membership and this invitation to come to the General Theological Seminary um, were cited as major objections to the seminary dean's election as Bishop of Springfield in 1878, proving that even just to be a friend of a member of the CBS could get one in trouble, even when one wasn't a member. The confraternity weathered these storms and emerged as an influential survivor of the churchmanship wars of the 1870s. But I would contend that it was a major reason why Grafton's own election to the Episcopate itself was controversial. His association with the CBS and its extreme doctrines and practices were not mentioned explicitly in the press by those who declined consent for his election, but I think it's worth remembering just how many dioceses did withhold consent from him for his election. The list is surprisingly long and doesn't add up to the political lines that we would think about today. The Diocese of Albany, Central Pennsylvania, Western West Virginia, Western Michigan, Montana, Iowa, Kentucky, Pittsburgh, Virginia, and Maryland all voted against the consecration of Bishop Grafton as third as second bishop of Fond du Lac. Almost immediately after his election and consecration as bishop, Grafton assumed the office of Superior General of the Confraternity in 1890, an office in which he would serve until his death in 1912. He succeeded a uh, Neshota graduate, the Reverend Edward Allen, Allen Larrabee of the Church of the Ascension in Chicago, who had served as Superior General from 1887 to 1890. Incidentally, Father Larrabee was the last parish priest to serve as Superior General of the Confraternity, and all of his successors, beginning with Grafton, have been uh, diocesan bishops of the Episcopal Church. By 1901, there were five bishops of the Episcopal Church, 330 priests, and 1,600 lay associates enrolled as members. The Church Times of the Diocese of Milwaukee, which is a fascinating periodical, which unfortunately no longer exists, um, said with understated confidence, the confraternity is growing slowly, steadily, and quietly, and is doing a very good work. To put these numbers in perspective, uh, five bishops and 330 priests, um, by Grafton's own accounting, there were at this date 80 bishops and 5,000 priests in the Episcopal Church. So the CBS represented in 1921 about 1 16th of our bishops and about one in every 15 priests. Of this diocese of Fond du Lac, he was proud to say, all, or nearly all, of our priests are members of the confraternity. From this period, we can see certainly some of the reason behind Bishop Grafton's oft-quoted statement the world is my diocese. And we can understand, too, some of the hostility of bishops of other dioceses whose clergy looked to Grafton as a spiritual authority 
through his position as Superior General of CPS. Next month will mark 145 years of the confraternity's existence in the United States. Despite its significance in the history of global Anglicanism, as well as in the Anglo-Catholic movement especially, the confraternity is not mentioned even once in Ken and George Edmund DeMille's seminal work, The Catholic Movement in the Episcopal Church. The much longer and thorough Men and Movements in the American Episcopal Church, published in 1950, does mention the confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament, but only three times and almost completely in passing. To date, the only sustained examination of the history of the Confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament is a 50-page commemorative volume published for internal circulation in 1964. So in the absence of a central and permanent archive of the Confraternity's papers and publications during its 145 years in the United States, our primary source for the examination of Bishop Grafton's writings and activities in connection with it are his published addresses to the annual meetings sometimes called conferences of the organization, held on Corpus Christi or on some other convenient day near it. The eight-volume cathedral edition of Grafton's works, published by a sometime dean of this cathedral, includes addresses from 1900, 1902, 1903, 1907, 1909, 1910, and 1911, along with one undated address. I'm not going to read them all. <laughs> but I'll digest some of the great things that come from These eight addresses provide a detailed account of Bishop's Gra Bishop Grafton's participation in and direction, direction of the life of the confraternity, and they show in some public clarity his opinions about controversial issues surrounding Eucharistic worship in late 19th century and early 20th century Anglicanism. In his first extant address, we can almost catch a smiling glint in the bishop's eye when he offers counsel about why it's appropriate to celebrate Corpus Christi, the Thursday after Trinity Sunday, as a special day of devotion to the Eucharist. This was a, a, a highly controversial and, 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 and controverted uh, uh, issue in the Episcopal Church at the time. He says, on the last Thursday in November, we keep a day sanctioned by the church in thanksgiving for the fruits of the earth. If we are to keep a day in thanksgiving for the daily bread which supports our bodies, is it not more fitting that we should keep a day in thanksgiving for the gift of the true bread from heaven, which is the spiritual food of our souls? As a son of Puritan New England, he's very comfortable turning the tables on Protestant-minded Christians who reject Corpus Christi on the grounds that it had its roots in the pre-Reformation Roman Catholic Church. The bishop says, if it is no objection that Thanksgiving Day was started not by the church, but rather with the Puritans and in opposition to the church's festivals, Certainly, it can be no objection to keeping the Feast of Corpus Christi that had its genesis in another branch of the church and may be connected with doctrines in that communion which, with which we do not agree. From this almost cheerful assertion of the correctness of keeping a special feast about the Blessed Sacrament, we move not very long after to a concentrated reflection on rationalism as an enemy of religious devotion. Grafton's address to the community in 1909, gathered in New York City, while he was here and read in absentia, strikes to the heart, in addition to the mind, but nevertheless above the mind, as the primary place where the Christian soul grows in relationship with God through Holy Communion. You all know, he says, that no great religious cause ever succeeds which is chiefly an intellectual one. It must be devotional. It must be something more than devotional. It must have in it the warm, tender action of piety. The question before you is how to awaken this in your own hearts and in the hearts of your people. We have to teach them, of course, about the real presence, but we want them to love it and surround it with all the dignity of beauty of worship. And we want, above all, to kindle in their hearts an intense feel of per a feeling of personal love to our dear Lord in the Eucharist. There he trusts himself to us. There he allows us to enter into the very mysteries of heaven itself. With a love that is beyond human love, let us develop within the church a love to our blessed Lord. We must sing our hymns to him, prostrate ourselves before him, cherish him in our hearts, and ever come back to him. May he touch our hearts and minds with a coal of fire from his divine altar, and fill us with a new spirit, new intention, new devotion, new consecration to Jesus. Let us love our confraternity and press on the kingdom. 
The primary thrusts of Grafton's addresses to the confraternity cluster around three topics. First, he's very concerned to rein in excesses in ritualism by well-meaning clergy who distract from the doctrine of the Holy Eucharist by introducing ritual practice, practices unfamiliar to or unwelcomed by their parishioners. Second, he makes a regular and concerted constant effort to defend the reservation of the Blessed Sacrament, the regular setting aside of a portion of the consecrated elements of the Eucharist after the service in a tabernacle or armory. And last, there's a regular repetition of a request to encourage a traditional fast before receiving Holy Communion. In working to make reservation of the Eucharist for the sick, not just a tolerated practice, but a widespread one, Grafton spoke in lockstep with his English brethren and the CBS. And this is also true of his repeated exhortations to keep the Eucharistic fast. But Grafton was not just echoing contemporary English attitudes, even as he did act as the major, the major mediating figure of English Anglo-Catholicism, first into the large cities of the American Northeast, specifically Boston, Boston and New York, and then into the small towns and sea cities of the upper Midwest. There are a number of then controverted points on which Bishop Grafton does not actually follow what has become the mainstream of Anglo Catholic practice in the United States. In a 1903 Lenten letter, for example, Bishop Grafton condemns the altering of the order of the 1892 Book of Common Prayer in any way. Most specifically, for people who remember the 1928 prayer book, which followed the same order, he, he objects to the moving of the Gloria from the end of the service to the beginning of the service. His sustained attack on this attempt to change the liturgy in a direction that would make it more similar to contemporary Roman Catholic practice is as strenuous as it is in the end actually quite mystical. Do nothing simply because Rome does it. Union with Rome is not our issue. It is not what we are working towards or for. We have our own Catholic liturgy and our own special work to do. Let us try and keep step together. When asked about the wisdom of altering the order of our Mass and putting the Gloria and Extralsis at the beginning of it, I have said that I did not think it any game to do so. It was the primitive arrangement, and may be rubrically defended, but we lose by it. Unlike the Roman order, where the priest consumes the remainder of the elements after the communion, our liturgy enforces the reservation of the Blessed Sacrament. In our Lord's sacramental presence reserved, we sing our Gloria and Extralsis. It is for something of larger import than adoration. It is for the purpose of developing our spiritual commerce with our Lord and our abiding spiritual communion with him. It is a carrying on of the devotion of our church, which has instructed us by placing the glory in Excelsis where it is. Grafton also objected strenuously to the use of the term transubstantiation in stating the doctrine of the real presence. The Church Catholic has never defined the how of this great mystery, he said. We do not need to burden our presentation of the truth with unnecessary difficulties, of argument or definitions. What we want to teach is the vital truth of our Lord's real presence. By virtue of the consecration, our Lord is verily and, and indeed present under the recognized species with which he is sacramentally identified. Grafton actually also opposes processions with the Blessed Sacrament and extra liturgical adoration of the reserved sacrament but chiefly on the grounds that they were inexpedient at that time rather than completely inappropriate. But as much as he had posed some developments in American Anglo-Catholicism, the usual posture of Grafton's annual addresses, addresses to the confraternity is a positive plea for growth and extension. By 1911, and I'm coming to the end because Grafton's end was in 1912, <laughs> he articulated an impassioned cry on the offensive side for Catholic practice in a voice that I think is quite unfamiliar to us in the Episcopal Church today. We must make an earnest missionary effort. We must strive to get in touch with those now separated from us. We must have a zeal for converting individual souls. Every churchman, one to a belief in the Blessed Sacrament, becomes a power in the church. We must, and here he's speaking to priests, offer the holy sacrifice daily if we can. We must encourage devotion to the Word and Sacrament. We must, by the adornment of our altars, reverence the presence of our Lord. We must, by our acts of worship, bear witness to the presence of Christ. I send you on this day my love and blessing and this word of encouragement. Christ is with us, and if we are but faithful and seek after sanctity ourselves 
and offer the daily sacrifice. He will reward our efforts beyond what we can now conceive. Just a year later, in 1912, the bishop was in his final decline, suffering from diabetes, kidney failure, and exhaustion. But he sent a final telegram to the confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament just three months before his death with these words. My prayers, love, and blessing for the members of the CBS and conference today. In 2012, speaking as modern Episcopalians, it's possible to say that the confraternity has, has exerted influence wide enough and far beyond its always relatively small borders to consider the main body of its objects, rules, and recommendations as what are really now normal aspects of modern and open faith and practice. The 1979 prayer book, and to my knowledge, every other current author, authorized liturgy of the entire Anglican Communion, notes that Holy Eucharist should be celebrated as the principal service on every Sunday in the year. In our ecumenical dialogues with other Christians, most especially with Orthodox Christians, Roman Catholics and Old Catholics, but also with Scandinavian Lutherans, the Episcopal Church and official bodies of the Anglican Communion have stated in clear terms that we believe the Holy Eucharist to be a sacrifice and a sacrament, and the sacramental representation of Jesus Christ's self-offering for our salvation through his death, resurrection, and ascension. The prayers of the people in the communion orders of the 1979 ECP even embody the main intercessory objects of the confraternity. We pray for the unity of the Church of God, for the forgiveness of our sins, for the sick and the suffering, and for the right reception of the sacrament. And although it is true that not every Anglican today belongs to a parish church in which the sacrament is reserved in a tabernacle or omri for communion of the sick, I know of no diocese in the Episcopal Church or other part of the Anglican world in which it would be considered illegal or even problematic for a priest to do so. Is that my wrong? Sydney. Oh, right. <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> Australia. <laughs> Just Sydney. <laughs> You're exactly right. I'm wrong. Um, the centennial history of the confraternity noted that what had begun as a fringe group of devotional outcasts could, by 1964, number 37 bishops of the Episcopal Church among its bishops associates, including every bishop of Fond du Lac to that date after Grafton, Reginald Heber Weller, Harvard Sturdivant, and William, William Hampton Brady, all now of blessed memory. Since the time that history was written, Reverend, Reverend William Lewis Stevens, sixth bishop of Fond du Lac, and now himself of blessed memory, continued the same tradition with his enrollment as a life member from April of 1983. So in this place, we have very, very much for which to give thanks in the lasting impact made throughout the church uh, by Bishop Grafton through his work in, in the confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament. I contend that the Eucharistic life of the Episcopal Church today would be entirely different without Grafton's active intervention at a crucial period in the 1860s and, by, and his strenuous anti-Roman attitudes during a series of critical moments from the 1890s until his death. Almost 50 years since the last published history of confraternity, however, I wonder if we're right to be satisfied with what seems to be the outward accomplishment of all of these goals, goals that were some of the most dear of Bishop Grafton's entire life. I hope that I'm not being harsh when I say that this would be the worst possible reaction. I believe that Bishop Grafton calls us today through his work in the confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament to look in two directions. One certainly forward, and one slightly backward. He calls us in his writings and in his example to live our lives going forward with hearts full of the love of Jesus Christ, nourished by the Holy Eucharist, active in providing for the poor, the sick, and the suffering. He calls us to receive our next Holy Communion as we have never received it before. And we have the chance to do just that this afternoon with new attitudes of gratitude and sincerity, with new intentions of reconciliation, with new attempts at sincere repentance, and with new appreciation of the gifts of every sort given to us by God. He calls us to do this in the here and now, in the places where we live, to bloom where we're planted, as the old song says. That, I would submit, is the lesson of the seal of the Diocese of Fond du Lac, on Bishop Grafton's tomb. We live our lives in a given place, a planted place, a place fixed, 
or temporary depending on our circumstances, but nevertheless in a place. In that place, wherever it is, we may and can and should strive to lead more truly Eucharistic lives. On the other side of the tomb, we see the seal of the Confraternity of the Blessed Sacrament, and we are right to ask what the symbol of such an old and today relatively small and perhaps uninfluential organization might mean today. I ask this, of course, whether or not we are members of this venerable group. I suggest this afternoon that it signifies a possibility for a return to practices lost or forgotten, such as the Eucharistic fast, intentional and mutual intercession during the celebration of Holy Communion, confession before communion when our consciences are troubled. I would suggest, too, that it is a sign of a call to see the Blessed Sacrament afresh as something scandalous, exciting, countercultural, important enough to seek out friends who have the same fascination and interest, important enough to stand up for with others, and to join with them, and so with Jesus, as often as we can. In very funny words by L.P. Hartley from a novel called The Go-Between, we read, the past is a different country, they do things differently there. I think we can find a good reason to look backward, even while we press on the kingdom, to use Bishop Grafton's good words. He might say, the mass is a foreign country, we do things differently there, and I would be happy to be your interpreter and tour guide. In his own words, he writes just two months before his death. I am unable to be with you today in person, but you know my earnest desire is for the spiritual growth of this diocese. I lovingly urge you to a greater belief, trust, and love of our Lord in that wonderful mystery of the Blessed Sacrament. Honor our Lord's presence by music, lights, flowers, and incense. He will honor those who love him. Do not argue about it, but believe in it.